Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts now. Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. This is the spot right here. This is the location. You found it where the conversation is pointed and the guests are sharp and the responses are never dull. And today we are down in the land down under with Carolyn Smith Hewen. I am so excited to have her as a guest. You know, Brains, um, she loves under the sea. She's an environmentalist. She's going to give us tips on what we can do to help protect and sustain the environment. But she's also been under the water herself personally, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about that and figure out how we can all rise to the occasion and live on top of the water. Let's welcome her to the edge. How are you, Carolyn? And welcome. Thank you so much, April. I'm wonderful today. I'm having a fabulous day. I'm <laughs> it's lovely to that. see you. I'm loving that. So please tell my brains a little bit about you, your history, and how you show up in the world. Cool. So I guess the first thing to say is um, I've had a very adventurous life. Um, I grew up in very remote parts of Papua New Guinea and Northern Australia. And so I've been immersed in some beautiful cultural experiences throughout my life. And I have a very adventurous father who was a, a spear fisherman. And he got our family into scuba diving and into the water fishing initially. And then um, as I started to scuba dive when I was around 15, I turned to my father and my mother and my brother under the water and, you know, pointed at a few things. And when we got to the surface, I said, what was that? You know, what does it do? What does it eat? And of course, they couldn't answer my questions. And I talk a lot and ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so I decided I better go to university and become a marine biologist <laughs> so I can answer my own questions and um, teach other people uh, about the things I saw underwater. And I was so blessed um, to have had such a beautiful family that, that loved to do those sort of things together. And as I went through my university years, um, I just fell in love with corals. Absolutely. They were just my thing, you know, these crazy little creatures that don't go anywhere. They sit on the reef and feed, you know, some of them hundreds of years, sometimes even a thousand years. Mm. The same animal lives in the same spot and get exposed to whatever comes its way in that time. And of course, I ended up in Townsville on the Great Barrier Reef for my degree, which is uh, where James Cook University is. And it was famous for world class research on corals. So that's where I ended up. And I've stayed here. Um, I finished my degree, met a man, um, you know, in a shopping center. He was cute, tall, handsome, and I married him. <laughs> he wow. has a permanent job here. And I thought, well, what better place for a marine biologist to be stuck? Someone who loves corals, stuck on, on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and so, yeah, I was very fortunate then to go and work for the Australian Institute of Marine Science and they had some fabulous boats and they took me out to fabulous places on the reef diving. Um, but I also did some research on pearl oysters, which was really fantastic, something a little different. And I went to Western Australia and I studied pearls and how they were made and the oysters that were being collected from the bottom of the ocean to, to turn into the beautiful jewellery we know as, you know, our South Sea pearls. And so, so they yeah. are very much a living organism that we adorn our necks with it. But you Absolutely. know, I did something in all transparency, and I've always felt very guilty about this. I yeah. went uh, snorkeling. Yeah, I'm not the best swimmer, <laughs> and I was panicking a little bit, and I was stepping on. I was in Guam, yes. and I was stepping on the coral. And my friend goes, "Be careful, April. You know that is a living creature." People don't take that into consideration. I felt so guilty. I was like, okay, do I save the coral or do I save my life? Man, <laughs> you know. You have but my it, blessing to save your life. Yeah, and cool. you know what else I did that I wasn't supposed to do? I took a little piece of it. Yeah. It's so great. Well, it, well, it was broken off already. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't separate it from its family. But, <laughs> But it's like plankton and all that. Explain that to us about coral and the coral reef and how we must sustain it and protect it. 
Yeah. So as I said, some corals can live for hundreds to thousands of years. And that little piece that you broke off actually would have reattached itself and formed another. I didn't. It was already yeah. broken off. Yeah. So if it's broken it up, off, I thought I yeah. could put it in some salt <laughs> water and save it. In save it. Yeah. Obviously, I did, I did no, wrong. I didn't do that. That's okay. all right. But just many... think how many people do that. And, exactly. and also all of the toxins that they put in the water. So again, I'm sorry. Please tell That's us about right. coral. So yeah, so your little piece of coral it, um, would have broken off, however it came, will have reattached. And that is a little animal. And it's in fact, hundreds of little polyps all with their own individual little mouths and they can reattach to the bottom. So that little piece of coral, if it was blown off in a cyclone or a storm, it would have rolled across the reef, attached somewhere else and grown another colony. And that way the same individual spreads its risk and is in two different places on the reef. So if a hungry crown of thorns wanders along and eats the first part, the other part is still living somewhere else on the reef, which is one of the fabulous things about coral. But although they have these incredible sort of regenerative powers, if you like, if you snap off a piece of coral, it'll just grow back over the little bit that broke off and the bit that broke off will form another potential colony. Mm. But they seem like they're these they're rocky hard things and they seem like if they've got this amazing power they must be you know um they must be bulletproof but the reality is they actually have evolved in a very stable environment in the tropics where the temperatures in particular are really quite stable throughout the year they don't vary huge amounts and so they don't like hot water so the best thing people can do for corals is actually turn their lights off and conserve energy and invest in green power options because climate change is honestly the biggest impact. And when I finally went on to do a PhD and I actually studied coral bleaching, which is the process when corals get too hot or too stressed, mm -hmm. they lose all their colour. And so you can see their beautiful white skeleton through the transparent tissue of the coral. And what that means is the coral has lost all of the little algal cells that are inside it, which give it a lot of its colour. So it's actually a symbiosis between an algal, an algae, a little tiny single cell algae, and an animal. And the animal kicks out the algae when they start misbehaving, when they get too hot or too stressed, and then they have nothing left to feed them. So they have like these little plants in them that feed them. So once those are gone, they're potentially very, very stressed and they will eventually die if they don't get them back. So is so, it different? Yeah. Is it a different species? Is it, you know, uh, because the coral reefs are so many different colors. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's the fantastic. There are hundreds of different species of coral. And the great thing is some of them are more resistant to bleaching and a bit more temperature tolerant than others. And so even though we might see massive coral bleaching, and you might have 90% of your reef die in a really hot year. And that's happened around certain reefs around the world with the recent um, bleaching events and the high temperature events having these heat waves. There will still be a few individuals and a few species, the more tough ones, that are left on the reef, uh, which is, you know, that gives us some hope that they can, you know, adapt and evolve and there will be some form of reef structure left into the future. But the more we can do to limit the temperature increases now, the more diversity we're going to see. And those beautiful colours and shapes and varieties of corals will stay on our reefs if we can start to really rein in climate change as quickly as possible. And of course, the corals. Coral, what does coral eat? What the plankton? They do eat plankton. A lot of them will be what filter feeders. So you'll see their little polyps. They have a mouth in the centre and they have little tentacles that will wave. Sometimes they come out at night. Some species come out during the day. They'll catch plankton and they can feed themselves that way. But probably 90%, 95% of their nutrition comes from those little algae that live inside their tissues. Wow. And so when they get hot or they get stressed and they're exposed to, say, pesticides, they're exposed to um, other you know, chemical wastes no, that might trash. be coming in, trash, that sort of stuff, all adds to the chemicals butts. in the water. Cigarette butts, your microplastics are a really big problem. So the corals don't know the difference between a tiny little bit of plankton and a big, tiny little bit of plastic that's mm. broken down off a big plastic bag or some other bit of plastic. So corals are actually ingesting all of the time a lot of um, that plastic. And whilst they're able to spit it out fairly effectively, unfortunately, the chemicals that are attached to the plastic right. leach into their tissues and can affect wow. the health. Wow. You know? And that's true for many other organisms, not just the corals. So the, right. the, all of the animals on our reefs 
um, potentially get stuck in plastic bags and tangled in them. So really containing our rubbish and really making sure we're trying not to use single-use plastic bags and things that blow away in the trash um, as much as possible, looking after our climate. I know. I, I got some know? beautiful baskets that I go grocery shopping with now. And yeah. people, think, people think I'm pretty chic and pretty trendy. Oh, I Ooh, love yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's renewable and it is sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about some of the other beautiful things that you've seen under the sea. I mean, you're a scuba diver and yeah. you absolutely love to scuba dive. Yeah. And recently, because I, I kind of went from being an active marine biologist in the water to when my daughter came along 14, 15 years ago, um, I switched to being a lab manager. So I didn't get out in the water for nearly 15 years. And so just recently, I had my first dive in 15 years on Opal Reef up in Port Douglas, just a few hours north of where I live. And I've got to say, I was, I was a little bit um, nervous and anxious about getting in the water. One, because I hadn't dived in a long time. But two, because I knew the reef had been really suffering and I was expecting to see terror, terrible things. And I jumped in the water and I had the most spectacular dive I've ever had. I, bar none, it was beautiful. I saw turtles. I saw big Maori wrasse, huge, big, beautiful, bright coloured fish with big bumps on their heads. Um, I saw nudibranchs, so these little tiny sea slugs that are bright, bright colours and little, they've got little feathery bits on them. So they just, they're beautiful. And I had honestly, and I can say this with a hand on my heart, without a word of lie, in all the years I've been diving, the hundreds of dives I've had, I have never seen so many moody branks as I did on that particular dive. They were everywhere. Um, well, that was stuff. because too, hmm. it was a very uh, special reunion. You dived with wow. your parents again. I did. You know, and you took your daughter for the first time. And I, I bet that was such a bonding experience. Oh, so I the whole get thing, goosebumps. So the whole thing just evolved and immersed from under the sea. Yes. But how did you find yourself underwater with post-traumatic stress disorder? Mm, that was a good question. Now that was, it's a, it was a long road. So I'm, you know, in my late 40s now. And I started in my early 40s to notice that I was a little bit, what they call hypervigilant. So when I had my daughter, there were some stresses. Um, you know, she, I had a challenging pregnancy, a lot of pain. I had a challenging birth and she spent a bit of time in a neonatal ward. Um, and then, you know, she had some life-threatening allergies to common everyday things like milk and eggs and, you know, I had to put her in daycare. Um, and so over my adult life, I've accumulated some kind of stress factors. And I started to get very protective, of course, of my child. But then other people in my environment I started to get protective of too. And when I became a laboratory manager, um, I really wanted to protect the young scientists that were in my lab. And so I worried a little bit about, you know, the things they were doing. And so I managed to make the lab a very safe place and a wonderful community that looked after each other. But I forgot to look after myself. <laughs> and I kept saying yes to things that, you know, were, were really important things to do, like make the other laboratories around the university safer. But what I hadn't done was gone back and sort of looked through my past at some of the adverse events that had happened in my younger years in my childhood. Um, and unbeknownst to me, they contributed to this sense of um, a lack of safety in the world and needing to protect people. So as a youngster, there was some inappropriate sexual touching Let's leave it at that. Uh, not from a family member, but outside the family. There was a rape in my teenage years and there were some other pretty yucky things um, later on in my life. Um, but I had always just gotten on with that stuff. You know, I'd never let any of that stuff drag me down. But I kind of shoved it in a suitcase, shoved it under the bed and I just kept going forward. And then one day when I got to my you know, early 40s and I realised oh, my Lord, there's all these people out there in the workplace that I, you know, all these young scientists that I want to protect and I can't protect them all. And my body just shut down. I started to get chronic migraines. So I literally had a migraine for nearly four years. Um, and it was crazy. I was, my whole world was like the world was rocking. It was like I was on a ship. So not only did I have the headaches uh, and the, that that's kind of what I, I'm, I'm about to go on the ship and the buoyancy. Yeah. So I can, you know, you never get your, your footing, even though you're still, you're yeah. still 
weaving and wobbling wow. and wavering. But you yeah. have that even with your experience of being under under yeah. all that time. Interesting. Yeah, I have a very strong what you call sea leg. So you can put me on a ship and it can be doing this and I'll feel nothing and I will never get sick. You put me on land after I've been on a ship, then I feel sick because the world is not moving. So the world for me should move. But when it's the building I was in, a four-story building I was in at work, started to feel like it was doing this while I was clearly on solid ground, mm -hmm. I got a little worried. And that sort of kept up, as I say, for four and a half years. Every time I would go to work, I would, within half a day, the world would start to do this, rock and roll. And it turns out I'd let myself run down so much that I had actually developed an infection which ate away some of the nerves in my inner ear. Mm. And that caused this imbalance. And so my whole body just rocked. <laughs> you know, I would have to ride my bike um, to, to work because it was just unsafe for me to drive. But I would still ride my bike to work right. with the world doing this. And I'd right. keep, keep, keep on going. I didn't listen to my body. Now, what do they say? I, That's your equilibrium, right? Yeah, I lost my equilibrium. Yeah, and then a uh, a lot of people. Uh, what is that uh, that they call it, where you lose your equilibrium? Um... Um, it was vestibular migraine they called it, or oh. yeah, or vertigo. Some people vertigo. get vertigo. Yeah, vertigo. when it spins. Yeah. So this is kind of a variant of vertigo. But yeah. what happened was that I then started to look into some like, why did my body do this? You know, it's not what it's supposed to be doing in its early forties. I was fit, otherwise fit and healthy. Um, and that's when I started to read about mind body medicine because a lot of the drugs they were giving me and the things they were getting me to do just weren't working for me. And um, suddenly I, I started to put two and two together and realize that some of the issues from my childhood that I hadn't dealt with and from my, you know, the yucky bits um, were just subtly playing with my nervous system and my brain. And so I'd become hyper responsive to stressful situations. And that was when um, I had a complete meltdown. Um, I had a young lady who revealed some stuff to me in a mental health check-in, ironically. And some of the stuff she shared with me was similar to some of the stuff I'd experienced. And that triggered post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And I'd already had it, apparently, just didn't know it. And so this was an aggravation of what they call the pre-existing condition of PTSD. But, you know, I was totally oblivious to it so it blindsided me and that was the final straw took the legs out from underneath me I could no longer get on my bike and ride in fact I didn't get out of my bed for three or four weeks because it just felt too scary and so as you progressed you know mm -hmm. and you, you found all of this going on did you uh, were you married at that time yeah so I've been married uh, well I've been with my husband for I've been married 18 years this year. We've been together 27 years. I've got a teenage daughter. So she was right. watching, you know, she was about 10 when mum kind of fell in a bit of a heap um, right. and then was on the couch for four years. And that was not the mother I wanted to be or planned to be. Right, right, and right. so I really, as much for my own sake, wanted to pick myself up and I wanted her to see that, but I didn't know how to do it. Right. And I didn't know how to do it until I finally stopped and my legs went out from under me and I got a proper diagnosis. Wow. So they, they went, okay, maybe this isn't migraine. Maybe this is post-traumatic stress. And since so then, it's just been up, up, up. Right, you yeah. got that. Let me just ask you just a couple, yeah. couple questions. Um, your daughter has seen you go from A to Z. Yeah. Um, I know that she's proud of you and encouraging yeah. you. Yeah. But as a mother, are you sharing with her some of the trauma that you experienced to help her dodge that bullet? Mm, yeah. When you, when you have things like this that are embedded in you, that's that inner generational trauma. Absolutely. And it will carry from generation to generation. I mean, I've heard people yeah. could go back six generations mm. and yeah. tell that trauma. And we have to break that cycle just like we have to not break off coral. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So as, she's, as you're going through this and you're having her have these conversations, what would you tell a mother? that is in a similar situation uh how to coax her daughter and how to coax herself into feeling better yeah so it's 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 hard work i'm not gonna lie you know you have to be committed to your own healing and you have to be committed to finding the right people to help you and just never give up um you know there'll be people who'll tell you which way to to do things 
um, and it might not feel right for you. And if it doesn't feel right for you, don't do it. Um, and I find the way that feels right for you. And particularly when it comes to intergenerational trauma, it can be really hard to understand why your nervous system is so jumpy when in some cases, nothing particularly bad might have happened to you. It's, it's happened a couple of generations ago. So I really encourage families to communicate and not to hide their trauma. I know you want to protect your children, but it's really important they understand where they came from. And it's important that you understand where you've come from. And as I'm a geneticist and I do a lot of reading about DNA, I've come to appreciate how that trauma of the past attaches physically to your DNA and it switches your stress response genes on. And so by understanding that now as a parent, when I see my daughter whose DNA was tagged by my trauma and the trauma of some previous generations, she came out of the womb thinking the world was a scary place. So she had high anxiety and those kind of things. And so what I say is, understand where the anxiety is coming from whether it's this generation and, and these events or the past and work with the nervous system you have understand the nervous system you have and if it's a little bit jumpy and hyper vigilant like mine then your child's is going to be probably next level again and so you need to teach your child a, a give, provide them with a stable supportive caring loving environment teach them self-compassion that it's okay to be a little bit different what we call neurodivergent so our our brains and our neural biology is wired a little bit different because of those experiences in our generational past and and in the, my generation and so we just have to work with that and that means we have to be i guess what they say the price of freedom is 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 eternal vigilance Absolutely. so we we have to learn to take some calming breaths find some ways that actually physically dim down the adrenaline and the cortisol in our system because I'm really good. I'm, I operate at full tilt on adrenaline and cortisol. Not everybody does. Right, <laughs> but, right, right. But it's not good for you. Mm. And if you do it forever, it catches up with you. And in my case, it slammed into me and wow. it stopped me. And so now when I stopped trying to stick pills down my neck and keep going and I stopped and slowed down and really went inside myself and looked at, all of what's gone on and started to address that with the right therapists, the right healers, and in the right way, all of a so sudden. Are you using a combination of, of modalities? Because I encourage yeah. that brains, you never know what's going to work until you figure it out. So, yeah. you know, you have great talk therapy. Uh, you know, some people are going to require medication. Some yep. people are not. Uh, you can have different healing modalities, yeah. energy work, spiritual work, you yeah. can do Reiki, you can yeah. learn to, and you know, they tell me that it is, I know it is, it's a whole different world under the sea. Oh, that yeah. too might have been your saving grace and your mm -hmm. solace, because that was a place for you to detach and separate yourself from what quote unquote, we know and see as the world today. Absolutely. So, uh, Tell us some fun things about you, Carolyn. Ah. The fact that you're a scuba diver. <laughs> yeah. What's the best meal you know how to cook? Oh, the best meal I know how to cook. Oh, look, it's got to be spaghetti bowl, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah. Look, I my you husband took over the meat or without. I'm a I'm a meat eater. Of I have right. to be in my house. My husband's very much a meat eater. He actually took the kitchen off me while I was writing my PhD, <laughs> and I was quite happy with that until I got sick of living on. At one stage, he went through a stage where he served me tuna and rice almost every day for a week oh my God. and I went oh dude put some veggies in that please exactly Do a something with that. I yeah. get it I get it if you um, were an animal under the mm, sea uh, what animal would you be and this one right here at the moment really? the manta ray yeah so Why? because the manta ray just flows and it sees the just beautiful thing so it can glide across a reef it can go out off to the reef edge and just you know, luxuriate in the beautiful blue waters of the open ocean. And they're such majestic creatures. And yeah, I, I, I sort of sat at the end of last year and, I, and as I was starting to get in touch with my inner child and all of these aspects of myself from the past that helped me survive some pretty yucky stuff, I just went, I just, I want to hop on the back of a, of a manta ray and I just want to 
cruise the yeah, ocean on the roof. You were about to say stingray because that's. I was going I to say stingray. <laughs> I was, okay, so what's the difference between a stingray and a manta ray? Okay, the stingray is generally a bottom dweller for the most part, although they will certainly swim, and they do have the sting in their tail. Whereas a manta ray, being an oceanic uh, creature, doesn't need to protect itself from being stood on, so it doesn't need a spiky tail. It oh. just needs to be able to glide away. And so, yeah, and they're much larger. The manta rays are much bigger. And sometimes they can be a little freaky. And I remember jumping in the water in very, very dirty water once because I'd seen these two twin fins and I went, that's a manta ray and so I jumped over the side of the boat I was in, much to the, the um, fright of the volunteers I had who were like, well, you're getting in the dirty water and you don't know that could be a shark. And I went, no, the, the fins were coming up at exactly the same time and going oh, down wow. and the, they were equidistant apart where that's got to be a ray of some description. So I jumped in and this ray came straight towards me and it appeared out of the gloom about a metre and a half in front of me coming straight at me. And so it turned and I kind of turned and we just about brushed belly as it went past me and it wasn't actually a, a manta ray it was a very similar kind of ray but a, a different type um, but it was just one of the most amazing experiences I've had underwater where I was that close to something so big and beautiful and wow. it just it knew that it you know I, it didn't it didn't go away in a fright it just knew that we had to just glide by each other. Right. And so it was we just, just, turned it was and just a synergy there and it, yeah. and it honored that space. And yeah. that's beautiful. If you had three wishes, Carolyn, oh. what would they be? Oh, the world would be a much kinder place. Um, people would be kind and compassionate and inclusive. They would celebrate diversity. And my daughter would grow up and be able to dive on the beautiful Great Barrier Reef in the state that it is now forever. You know, and your future wow. generations would see it as it is now. And, and as, it, as it was when I started, you know, there are patches of it which have degraded, but there are still beautiful patches like Opal Reef where, you know, I dived with my daughter and my mum and dad for the first, their first dive in 20 years. Well, um, I know. My daughter's I, first ever dive. We shared that right before we, yeah. you know, we interviewed and we first connected and you were so excited and I followed yeah. you on Facebook. Uh, yeah. So what are you doing with all of the goodness that you have right now? Are you sharing this uh, with others? Are yeah. you back to educating at the university? Do you have private groups? Are you, what, what yeah. are you doing? Oh, it's really exciting. So I, I'm on a leave of absence from the university, but I am working on some other things. And that's one of which is my book. So I'm writing my memoirs and my life lessons um, in a beautiful book that'll come out early next year called The Evolution of Me from Marine Biologist to Wellness Warrior. So keep an eye on the my social media, because I'll let you all know when that's out and where to get it from. Um, I've started a Wellness Warriors United company. So I'm trying to um, teach the world about trauma, what trauma brain looks like from a biological point of view, what you can do about it to work with a trauma brain if you have one or someone you love has one. Um, and how that can lead to anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges. So this company is a mental health advocacy and support company. And I'm taking all the little tools that I've developed for myself to help me understand what I'm going through. And I'm going to be selling them and making them available to therapists and coaches and, and the general public, um, school counsellors and teachers, and providing some educational resources around that sort of area so that hopefully other people can get on a healing journey much quicker. And if you're supporting someone with mental health challenges similar to, to my own, um, that you can get some support too and know what to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that if that does well, then, um, and I have a Facebook group, which is everyone's invited to apply to join. And I don't promise everyone will, will get in because I want people to be kind and compassionate and, and comply with our values and make sure that if we let people into that tribe, it's called the Wellness Warriors United Tribe on Facebook. And we will turn it into an app. I'm working on that at the moment. So we'll have a community group within an app, oh. which is the Wellness Warriors United Hub. Um, and so in that, people will be able to, yeah, see me talking about trauma brain, how it develops, what we can do. I'll be sharing all my knowledge, my new knowledge. Um, and my love of nature will no doubt flow through that company and everyone will see um, me healing in nature and be able to follow my journey and, and maybe one day buy 
my book or a journal or another hands on well, unique. Well, yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to it. I give that to me again. Wellness Warriors United. Wellness tribe. Warriors, Warriors United. United. And the Facebook group is the tribe, Wellness Warriors United Tribe. And the app will be the Wellness Warriors United Hub. And that will be published hmm, sometime before. Well, I'm planning a big global launch on the 21st of January. I'm going to put it out there through the universe. And, and guess right. where I'm doing it? Where? Opal Reef. <laughs> so really? we're going to have a champagne breakfast with, you know, those of us who are diving, drinking orange juice. And then we're going to launch the book. Um, launch the app and then we're going to get on whoever comes to, to celebrate with me we'll get on the boat with me and we'll head out for some snorkeling funds and diving funds and maybe a, a, a small drink on the on the boat on the way back on the 21st of January 2023 we will launch okay. brains put that on your calendar get yeah, your money together you got to go to Australia Australia Port it Douglas so, you live from Port Douglas it is so worth it and again I have uh, raised my level of consciousness I will really appreciate, honor, and respect Coral yeah. from the top up and look down at the glass bottom boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. If you want to hop in the water with someone holding yeah, your hand, no, I'm more than happy to hold no your hand. <laughs> but thank you so much for the work that you do uh, you. on yourself, that you share with others, and that you do under the sea. Brains, it's about sinking or swimming. <laughs> what do you want to do? Where do you want to end up? What's important to you? What are your values? Do you value yourself? Are you going to let the things from your past continue to hold you down? Or are you ready to rise above them? I hope so. We're going to give you all the information you need right here on the edge. Like, love, share, and subscribe. One more time. Like, love, share, and subscribe. Listen to other edgy conversations. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And I'm so glad to see you in a really good space. All Thank right? you so much, April. All right. I love that. Bye, Brains. Have an amazing day. Bye, all.